America's intervention had brought the First World War to an end and started a new phase of 20th century fame, which Europe didn't yet fully understand, although the confused life and untimely death of Rudolf Valentino had already proved that something strange was going on. It was getting harder for anyone to do something remarkable, get famous for it, and then quietly retire. Famous people became something new under the sun. Celebrities, famous not just for what they did, but for being them. They lived their whole day and half the night in the limelight. If they didn't like it, they were out of luck. The day of the shy hero was almost done. At exactly the wrong moment, the greatest shy hero of all time prepared to perform his death-defying feat. His name was Charles Lindbergh. As good-looking as any film star, at first glance, Lindbergh was a gift from heaven for the omnivorous new means of mass communication. He let them do all the communicating. They called him the Flying Fool. Lindbergh's wings were frail, but at least they didn't come from the prop department. He was real. He was patriotic. He was perfect. The whole of America flew with him across the Atlantic. The trip took long enough for newspapers to carry reports of his progress. The country built by Europe's rejects was sending its sensationally brave son on a voyage of conquest in reverse. When he arrived in Europe, it was like Columbus coming back all on his own. The press stopped calling him the flying fool and started calling him the Lone Eagle. But the Lone Eagle was soon looking trapped. The press and the newsreels believed that they had helped to build Lindbergh up, and there was something to it. The Lone Eagle had never been entirely alone. The idea of flying solo across the Atlantic wasn't a lonely dream. It was a competition with $25,000 in prize money. It could have been won by someone else. It could have been won by René Fonck. Fonck was a French war hero whose attempt to fly the Atlantic was foiled only because he took too many croissants with him. If he had traveled light, the name of Fonck would have resounded through the 20th century. So the press couldn't help believing that Lindbergh owed them something when they called him a hero. They wanted cooperation in return. He came home to a hero's welcome. Battleships sank under the weight of photographers. In New York, more than four million people turned out to see him. The ticker tape formed drifts knee deep to cushion the fall of fainting secretaries. He had to fight hard to keep smiling. The press, which had sung hosannas to his silence, now wanted him to say something and the same silence looked like ingratitude. He was the same man, but the rules had changed. He had done his deed, and there was no bigger deed left to do. The only comparably astonishing one-trip flight left to make was to the moon. So there was no story there. The only story left was his private life. Lindbergh wanted to keep it private. The press tried to intrude, and he tried to keep them out. So that was the story. He was lucky that film didn't talk because his silence spoke volumes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. You want to hear good, good, good me? All right, hold on, hold on. When film acquired a voice, it belonged to a Broadway musical star whose stock in trade was the kind of energy that couldn't be stopped with gunfire. Al Jolson. Good, good, good me. Goodbye. Good, 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 don't cry. The little train. That takes me away from 
Jolson did a blackface act that graphically demonstrated what America's real black people were up against. It never occurred to him that he was being racist. In those days, prejudice was blind, and Jolson had a song to prove that it was deaf, too. Mammy. Mammy. The sunshine beat, the sunshine wet, but I know where the sunshine best. Mammy, Mammy, my heart strings are tangled around. Alabama, I, I'm a coming. Sound film Sorry. turned Jolson from a crass vaudeville headliner into a world famous crass vaudeville headliner. I hope and trust I'm not late. Mammy, I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles for my mammy. That isn't the way to use that. But sound films spelled the end for the silent film stars unless they sounded as good as they looked. <sighs> Laurel and Hardy were just as funny with rude noises added, and there was the bonus that Hardy could say something, even if Laurel still didn't say much. Their real lives were taken over by their image, a fat man and a thin man in a fine mess. They had to live their assigned characters. Other countries made movies as well, but in America, it was a business. For the stars, it was part of the deal to be the person they played. Sport turned into a business too. Babe Ruth was the greatest name in baseball. Famous as a pitcher, more famous as a slugger. When he hit the ball, it went a long way. Sometimes it went clean out of the ballpark and into legend. His career took off with it. Soon he was more than a sportsman. He was a character. He was a great big wonderful baby without a mean bone in his body who just happened to be able to hit a baseball out of sight. When they asked him to go and catch a baseball dropped from an aeroplane, he went and did it. The babe was just too big a guy to spoil the fun. In reality, Babe Ruth was more complicated than that. He wasn't just Oliver Hardy with a baseball bat. Along with his well-publicized capacity to eat, went a less well-publicized capacity to drink. He could be awkward about contracts. But none of that was allowed to show. The emphasis was on how he seemed. He seemed human. He seemed human in a big way. In 1921, his signing on fee for the Yankees was $125,000 and he had already spent half of it on hot dogs. An America hungry for statistics about Babe Ruth was told how many hot dogs he ate and how fast, along with how many home runs he hit and how often. His fame didn't just have quality, it had quantity. When the Babe had trouble making the weight, it reassured American men who had trouble waking for work. Babe Ruth helped to make baseball grow big. Not even America could yet make its national sporting heroes into international celebrities. But boxing was an international sport. So when an American won the World Heavyweight Championship, there was nowhere on earth he wasn't a household name. The name was Jack Dempsey. Boxing went legal in 1919 and turned into big business. Dempsey was a famously mean fighter who got more famous the meaner he behaved. When Dempsey hit them, they stayed hit. If they tried to get up again, they usually wished they hadn't. 
the public was fascinated with the idea of a man who would hit below the belt even when his opponent was already lying down. Dempsey's character was box office. He wasn't just a famous fighter, he was a famous brute. So he was famous twice. After Dempsey had been on top for seven years, he lost his title to Gene Tunney and failed to regain it after the notorious long count incident, about which every boxing buff will give you the boring details, unless you get in fast with some cricket statistics. But the important thing was that Dempsey accepted defeat gracefully. He stopped being Mr. Nasty and started being Mr. Nice. He became famous for that too, so he was famous three times. Dempsey stayed famous. Even out of the ring, he was still courted by other famous people. Charlie Chaplin wanted to know him. As they pretended to fight, Douglas Fairbanks was the referee. Despite bravely acquiring an early example of the new plastic surgery operation known as the nose bob, Dempsey didn't get very far with his film career, but that became part of the story too. Later on, Dempsey lost all his money in the stock market crash, and that was part of the story. He staged a comeback as a restaurant owner, and other famous people came to eat. Dempsey had survived as a performer even when he ceased to be a champion. He had fought his way free of what he did and become somebody who simply was. Scarface Al Capone was Jack Dempsey gone wrong. Prohibition had made America's gangsters into headline news. The bad guys became big celebrities. Capone was the baddest guy, so he became the biggest celebrity. He loved the part and dressed up for it. The press couldn't get enough of him. All they had to do was turn on the lights and he did the rest. He paid for his own wardrobe. Extras to play dead bodies, he provided free. His car was built to stop bullets from other gangsters. The cops never shot at it. They just gave lectures about it on those rare occasions when he was briefly detained to answer easy questions. The fact that this car is equipped with a regulation police siren. The siren in this car would enable Capone to get away at any time, as it is one of the laws in the United States that no one but an official, a police or a fireman may have one of these on his car. Compared to the cops he had corrupted with payoffs, Capone looked honest. Apart from the people who were actually getting beaten up or rubbed out, the whole world seemed to like the idea that at least one man was up there above the daily grind. Capone liked the idea too. Al Capone's fame put him beyond good and evil. He was in show business. He didn't really want to be a killer at all. He wanted to be a star. For the next 70 years, stars wanted to be him. Arnie, you're through. You hire these mugs, they miss, now you're through. If you ain't out of town by tomorrow morning, you won't never leave it except in a pine box. I'm taking over this territory. From now on, it's mine. There's only one thing that gets orders and gives orders, and this is it. That's how I got the south side for you, and that's how I'm gonna get a north side for you. Some little typewriter, eh? I'm gonna write my name all over this town with it in big letters. Hey, stop him, somebody. Get out of my way, Jenny, I'm gonna spit. Yeah. There's a guy to see, an assistant DA from the county. That's a District 31 for me. You gonna arrest me for speeding or something? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We'll all relax, take it easy, we'll play real legitimate, okay? Okay, Giorgio! Stop yelling, you're not in the barn. I'm sorry. You've got no man. My name is Bob Buell, Mr. Capone. Well, Mr. Wait, Attorney whoa, is... whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. The name is not Capone, it's Capone. Capone. Mr. Capone? him! In his own house! Shot him! His friend! Friday, darling! Caronia! Can you do it? He's feeling it! He's feeling it! He's feeling it! 
macchino nero inferno oh. per un milione d'anni. All right. Who killed him? Three men. Two of Moran's punks. And Giuseppe Aiello. Aiello? Capone is a classic part. Yeah. The big part. America's King Lear. What was it you were saying, Charlie? Sometimes they change his name, but it's always him. Capone's epic has lasted longer than Lindbergh's, and it's because fame suited him. He needed fame. It was a step up. It was a step up for honest people, too. In Prohibition America, the black inventors of the 20th century's most exciting music had the same prestige as minstrels. Louis Armstrong's brilliant trumpet solos were works of art from a sweatshop. The works of art were preserved on classic records, but white men controlled the record business and stole the money. To stay solvent, the artist had to become an entertainer. Louis Armstrong, the revolutionary modern musician, turned into Satchmo, the showman. Out on the road, night after night, Armstrong clowned it up. Uh, is anyone finer in the state of Carolina? If there is, then you know, show to me, Dinah. The dick not blazing, who love the city gazing to the eyes of Dinah and me. Baby, every man what I shake with fat on. Cut my dynamite, change my mind. But if he was wearing a false face, at least he had made it himself. When Hollywood put him in the movies, they put him in costume. Armstrong detested the Jungle Bunny outfits. He didn't like playing Uncle Tom either. But it was the price of fame. And fame was the road to freedom. You needn't tell me, boy, because I know. No one who became famous through achievement could stay famous without giving the press a story to feed on. The only hope was to control the story. Duke Ellington realized that it wasn't enough to be a serious musician. He had to behave like a serious musician, even though he never lost sight of the necessity to please the crowd. he managed to keep his dignity. For the white men who were out to exploit black talent, black dignity was an obstacle. Ellington fought back on behalf of himself and his band. They were always billed as Duke Ellington and his famous orchestra. Fame had made it possible to take his art to a wider world, but fame had also made him a representative of his people, a responsibility that no white musician was asked to bear. Ellington wasn't a black musician. He was a musician. But the mass media weren't interested in art. They wanted an angle. If the person of achievement wasn't prepared to be a celebrity, there was no story. Fame was a frame-up. Fame had Greta Garbo typecast as the woman of mystery who never said anything. The advent of sound film could have destroyed her, but she made it work her way by choosing exotic roles in which her heavy Swedish accent was a plus. Spoils, glory, flags and trumpets. What is behind this high-sounding word? Death and destruction. Triumphs of crippled men. Sweden victorious in a ravaged Europe. 
an island in a dead sea. I tell you, I want no more of it. I want for my people security and happiness. I want to cultivate the arts of peace, the arts of life. I want peace, and peace I will have. Away from the screen, she remained a celebrity famous for clamming up. All they got out of her was her name on the contract. All my life I've been a symbol. A symbol is eternal, changeless, an abstraction. A human being is mortal and changeable. With desires and impulses, hopes and despairs. I'm tired of being a symbol, Chancellor. Garbo had proved that a star who sounded foreign still had a future in American movies, especially if she could sing. Whether Marlena Dietrich could really sing is a question that can still provoke fisticuffs. But whatever it was she did, it didn't sound like anything homegrown. Dietrich outdid even Garbo in the European-style sensuality stakes. She was really exotic. Her American-born leading man was just dressed that way. She blew his mind. in the wine while it's wet. Let's do things that we live to regret. One of the first Hollywood musicals was The Merry Widow, and it seemed only fitting to import a continental star with plenty of savoir-faire and joie de vivre. Wrong not to do something wrong. When you do something wrong, you must do something right, and I'm doing your right tonight. But Maurice Chevalier was the unknown risk. The sure bet was his co-star, Jeanette MacDonald. She was a no-nonsense native-born American with a vocal range that ensured nobody would go to sleep during the performance, or for a good while after it either. Jeanette MacDonald was a huge star at the time, and she was soon matched with a huge co-star, Nelson Eddy. When I'm calling you Each had the uncanny gift of removing all signs of life from the other. But even when the musical was set in some outlandish landscape, there they were, two Americans singing at each other nose to nose. Sophisticated Americans called Eddie and MacDonald the singing capon and the iron butterfly. Unsophisticated Americans just bought tickets to see them. Real class was still in Europe. In a city like Vienna, the cult of the celebrity was still under control. Achievement was saluted by an elite, and fame could be a part of real life without taking it over. Sigmund Freud developed a complicated theory about how the unconscious determined behavior. His name was known to everyone who could read. The American press made him world famous by simplifying what he had to say, until eventually everyone in the world who could only just read came to believe that Freud thought sexual repression was bad for you. Berlin was another big city where bright sparks from the sticks brought their gifts. One of them was a previously obscure patent officer with bewildering ideas about physics. He was Albert Einstein, and Berlin's social elite lionized him. The American press made him world famous by spreading the vague notion that Einstein said everything was relative, so anything went. In the great cities of Europe, America still seemed far away. 
from Paris, it was a dot on the horizon. America had the money, but as far as culture went, Lindbergh had brought nothing with him except a reminder of his homeland's incurable provincialism. There were famous Americans who agreed with this assessment. They made Paris their stamping ground. Josephine Baker was black, sassy, and sexy offstage as well as on. The American press would have destroyed her. In Paris, she could be her real self without having to invent a false one. The American writer Ernest Hemingway was in Paris because of the favorable exchange rate. He was famous for writing modern prose of challenging simplicity. The American writer F. Scott Fitzgerald was in Paris because the alcohol was legal. He was famous for writing modern novels about the inner emptiness of the sophisticated. The Irish writer James Joyce was in Paris because his own country prosecuted writers for blasphemy. He was famous for writing modern novels about the inner complexity of the unsophisticated. The Russian composer Igor Stravinsky was in Paris because he had no country left to go home to. He was famous for writing modern music that people couldn't understand. The Spanish painter Pablo Picasso was in Paris because it was more interesting than a small town in Spain. He was famous for painting modern pictures that people couldn't understand but were too scared to say so. In Paris, to be smart was smart. Paris was an all-star spectacular of brilliant foreigners who were there for the exchange rate, the tolerance, the intelligence, and the style. But the style was set by a local girl. Her name was Coco Chanel. Her clothes made the fashionable feel artistic. Chanel was raised in an orphanage, but she turned chic into a birthright better than birth. At the peak of her fame, she turned down the hand of the Duke of Westminster, although she had already become intimately acquainted with the rest of him. Though Hollywood had plenty of talented dress designers, in 1931, Chanel was brought over to contribute the extra something that America was still convinced only Paris could do. With a contract to dress Gloria Swanson, Chanel graciously agreed to spend an entire year in Hollywood's barbaric atmosphere. In the 20s and early 30s, the news from Europe got to America within the month because the European editions of the new glossy magazines like Vogue were owned in America. American money bought European style. The Europeans thought they were getting the best of the bargain. They had so much tradition, they could afford to sell some. They had breeding. The Pusmoth aeroplane, and so far, has never let either of us down on any of our flights. I have absolute and implicit confidence in it, and I know it's going to see me through. Amy Johnson was living evidence that Britain still had more tradition than any other European country, and a bigger empire as well. She flew from one end of it to the other. There's a little lady who has captured every heart. Amy Johnson, it's you. We have watched and waited since the day you made your start. Amy Johnson, it's true. Since the news that you are safe has come along, everyone in town is singing this love song. Amy, wonderful Amy. Amy flew solo all the way to Australia. After she successfully crash-landed, she emerged from the wreckage to speak a language the Australians understood, although it didn't sound like their language or any other language spoken by an ordinary human being. It was the language of empire. Everybody. I seem to have got here at last. It's been a long, long time, but here I am, and jolly glad I am to be here at last. The British male record breakers also flew the flag. First Sir Malcolm Campbell, and then Sir Henry Seagrave, or vice versa, repeatedly broke the world record for maximum publicity over the measured mile.
The British Empire was one big happy family because most of its children were seen and not heard. But they were allowed to play together, even if they were different colours. The game they played was called cricket, and only people who belonged to the British Empire could understand it. Nobody outside the British Empire had any idea why these men were running backwards and forwards or talking a lot of incomprehensible jargon about hitting each other in the bales with a googly to the inside leg. England was the heart of the empire, but the English were very sporting about it when the natives did well. Australia's Don Bradman scored hundreds of runs at a time. And he's out. Don Bradman. Now I ask you, is he any good? Our Don Bradman. As a batsman, he can still lay on the wood. Or oh, when he goes into bat, he knocks every record flat. For oh, there isn't anything he cannot do. Eventually, the English decided that Bradman was a bit too much of a good thing. They slowed him down by aiming the ball at his head, a sporting concept known as fair play. Bradman was the Babe Ruth of cricket, except that the Americans had never heard of him, whereas even the most fanatical cricket lovers had heard of Babe Ruth. At the time, though, the British Empire still looked like the biggest thing in the world. At first glance, Mahatma Gandhi didn't look like the man to threaten a whole empire. But when you glanced again, he was still there. Leading what seemed like a hopeless, non-violent struggle to emancipate India from British rule, Gandhi showed himself highly skilled at using publicity as a weapon. He was already world famous without leaving home, because when he was interviewed, he had some smooth answers ready that left the man asking the questions looking uncomfortable. Uh, would you be prepared to die in the cause of India's independence? It is a bad question. If you go to the second round table conference, uh, will you go attired in native Indian dress, or will you prefer European dress? I should certainly not be found in European dress. And if the weather permitted, I should uh, uh, present myself exactly as I am today. When he came to Britain, he was a sensation. With no more than the sheet he stood up in, his fame was worth more to his cause than a whole army was to Britain's. Whatever the result of the mission that brought me to London, I know that I shall carry with me the pleasantest memories of my stay in the midst of the poor people of East London. And India. The burning gods, or ghats, or whatever they are, and the Taj Mahal. How was the Taj Mahal? Unbelievable. A sort of dream. That was the moonlight, I expect. Of course, you saw it in the moonlight. Yes. Moonlight can be cruelly deceptive. In 1925, Noel Coward had three plays on in London. But for Coward, the West End was just an out-of-town tryout for New York. Coward starred in his own plays on Broadway, too. It was where the fame was. He could see the writing on the wall. America was absorbing the whole world of entertainment. The Marx Brothers would have remained stars of Broadway and radio if it hadn't been for sound film. Harpo was essentially a silent comedian plus a motor horn. But Groucho talked. Nine dollars and forty cents? This is an outrage. If I were you, I wouldn't pay it. Now then, Mrs. Claypool, what are we going to have for dinner? You've had your dinner. All right, we'll have breakfast. Waiter. Yes, sir. Have you uh, got any milk fat chicken? Yes, sir. Well, squeeze the milk out. I want to bring me a glass. Yes, sir. Mr. Driftwood, three months ago, you promised to put me into society. In all that time, you've done nothing but draw a very handsome salary. You think that's nothing, huh? How many men do you suppose are drawing a handsome salary nowadays? Why, you can count them on the fingers of one hand, my good woman. I'm not your good woman. Don't say that, Mrs. Claypool. I don't care what your past has been. To me, you'll always be my good woman, because I love you. 
There. I didn't mean to tell you, but you, you dragged it out of me. I love you. It's rather difficult to believe that when I find you dining with another woman. That woman? Groucho doomed himself to a lifetime of cracking wise, but at least the supposedly unsophisticated Americans were now talking about sex in some shape or form. Holy cat! Hand me that telephone, you nitwit. Jean Harlow proved that an American girl could be almost as interested in sex as all those European women were famous for being. Mr. George and I are giving a small dinner for Lord and Lady Ferncliff, two very dear friends of mine from England. Gee, that sounds swell to me. Well, it's awful nice of you to ask us, Mrs. Jordan. We'll be glad to accept. I was reading a book the other day. Reading a book? Yes, it's all about civilization or something. A nutty kind of a book. Uh, Do you know that the guy says that machinery is going to take the place of every profession? Oh, my dear. That's something you need never worry about. <laughs> Harlow could act to match her looks. But she died young, and she never wrote her own dialogue. America's Stravinsky was George Gershwin. He had all the talent of a composer in the classical tradition. If he had been European, it would have been a scandal for him to get mixed up in the musical theater. Born in America, he took to Broadway without missing a beat. He took it over. He loved it all, the razzmatazz and the fame. He loved the girls, and the girls loved him right back. When Hollywood called, Gershwin answered. All over the world, Gershwin's admirers feared that he would be overwhelmed by too many parties and glamorous women. Gershwin was only afraid that he wouldn't. Hollywood wanted popular songs from him, and that's what he wanted to give them. He didn't think his art was being corrupted. He thought it was being developed. He was right. American popular art had always had energy, but now it had eloquence. Aimed at the masses with no apologies, it gave class to the classless. In one of the first big film musicals and one of the first films in color, Gershwin gleefully cooperated in a tasteless travesty of his masterpiece, Rhapsody in Blue. caked his music with arty pretension. That was the price of fame. The lasting result was that Gershwin and the other famous popular composers like Irving Berlin and Cole Porter had devised a new kind of musical landscape, which when treated naturalistically, provided the ideal setting for the next hero. Fred Astaire didn't look all that different from the ordinary guy in the audience. He could do extraordinary things, but he did them in a natural way, with no histrionics. He was exceptional, yet nothing set him apart. What he did was superlative without being superior. The way you hold your knife, the way we dance till three, With the studio's agreement, Astaire played it shy off-screen as well. It helped to keep the press off his back, and that helped him to last. What? what? <laughs> Boys and girls, uh, you know, uh, this is a kind of a new uh, thing for me. I I'm to, to announce an actor's master ceremonies for a little while, so you'll have to bear with me, because that's not my racket, if you know what I mean. Charles Lindbergh, who really was the shy American hero, 
had no studio to protect him. The press kept on coming. Lindbergh and his wife dutifully posed for photo opportunities celebrating the arrival of their baby. Lindbergh honestly thought that if he gave the press something today, they would stay away tomorrow. But as Lindbergh found out in the cruelest possible manner, the real trouble wasn't with the newspapers that splashed the stories, it was with some of the people who read them. Some of them were more than just curious. A few of them were crazy, and one of the crazy ones was a killer. When the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped, the biggest story of the century, the one about the lonely flyer, took off all over again. The press did the same sort of job on him as they had done before. The indiscriminate nature of 20th century fame was clearly demonstrated. Everyone climbed aboard the bandwagon. Al Capone, in prison at the time, offered a reward for the kidnapper's apprehension. When the baby's body was found, the scene was restaged for the newsreels as the Lindbergh legend took on a new, permanent lease of life through death. Hello, everybody. We're speaking to you now from the general store in Hopewell, New Jersey, the improvised uh, press headquarters uh, during the Lindbergh case. Lindbergh had always been in the difficult position of a private man at the center of a public event. Now, the difficult position had become impossible. At the trial, the alleged killer was Bruno Hauptmann. He was enrolled as the first in a regrettably long line of 20th century assassins who achieved celebrity for murdering the famous. Hauptmann almost certainly didn't do it. The victim was so famous that the police had to find a killer no matter what. But there was no doubt about who was really in the dock. It was the star witness. Lindbergh was the victim, but he was put on trial. He knew none of this disaster would have happened if he had not been famous. And now disaster was making him more famous still. Private grief was public property. The Lindberghs had not only lost their baby's life, they had lost theirs. Famous Americans, already worried that the fans might overwhelm them, now had to face the possibility that among the autograph hounds who press forward without seeming to realize they might crush their idol to death, might be some who did realize and who wanted it that way, and who studied the magazine photographs of the famous person's lovely new house looking for a way in. Fame, American style, suddenly looked helpless, like America itself. In Europe, a new breed of hero had more contempt than ever for America's culture of the common man. The uncommon man was on his way. A new aviator was due to drop out of the sky. And this one wasn't shy at all. Clive James' fame in the 20th century continues tomorrow night as Benito Mussolini struts to fame, while Hitler perfects the big lie. The American celebrity has a kinder, gentler approach to fame as a new brand of leading men, the strong, silent type, takes center stage in Hollywood. I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look. While the leading ladies in Hollywood's golden age foreshadowed the coming of the strong, independent woman, Say, listen, I've worked too hard to land this meal ticket to make any false moves now. Romance? Listen, peace is a whole lot more to me than any romance. They're not going to get me out on that limb again, ever. I am happy to speak to you from my home. President Roosevelt has informal fireside chats with an audience of millions. Joe Lewis becomes champion of the world. And if you wonder how becoming famous can change your life forever, Ask Britain's Edward VIII. I have found it impossible to discharge my duties as king without the help and support of the woman I love. And then the world goes to war. De Gaulle, Churchill, and Roosevelt rally their people. The warriors take center stage. Rommel, Montgomery, Patton, 
and MacArthur proved to be unparalleled showmen in this larger-than-life drama. Till the stars fade from above. <laughs> Hollywood moves to the front lines to cheer and rally the GIs. Bing Crosby, George Bernard Shaw, Johnny Weissmuller, and Albert Einstein are just some members of the great cast assembled by Clive James as he continues his look at the elusive nature of fame in the 20th century, tomorrow night on this public television station. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you.